Good afternoon, everybody. It is Monday, April 5th, Investing 2020s with Kirk Spano, talking stocks of the week, and our updated uh, plug and play focus list for the quarter. Should have that out tomorrow morning. I don't want to show some of the new stocks tonight for the video. I'm going to do a little write up on those instead. But we're going to go through last quarter's list, and I'm going to give you some hints if you're listening closely, as well as explain a couple stocks coming off. Uh, but first, just in case uh, you haven't caught these yet, uh, I did do the interview with Meb Faber and the one with Matt Tuttle. So you should probably listen to these if you want to understand why I've been selecting certain SPACs. Go ahead and listen to this. Um, I know a lot of people have not put the effort into understanding the SPACs, and it's probably something that you should do. I know that people don't want to think about things differently ever, and that's the major hurdle that we all have is nobody wants to think differently. The problem is that the great investors don't think like everybody else. So I'm trying to teach you what I've learned and how I've made a lot of money finding companies that are big values, have hidden growth, have hidden asset values, or are ripe for some sort of merger and consolidation within an industry that unleashes all sorts of synergies. Uh, studies have shown that that is one of the best places to invest. So with that said, some of the stocks that I'm putting on the focus list this week uh, fall into that category, and they're mainly in healthcare. So when we pick out our focus stocks, we keep our investment philosophy in mind. I'm not gonna go through this whole thing with you, but I did add a section here at the bottom about what is our bottom line on stock picking. And for the most part, we only wanna buy great stocks or great companies. And we were going to ignore just about everything else. Why? Because even good companies with good returns aren't good enough to take individual company risk. A lot of things can blow up a company and then blow up the stock. We've seen a whole bunch of these charts lately where a stock that had run up two, three, four hundred percent loses 50 percent in a week. You have to be careful with individual company risk. So unless you're getting enough upside, you shouldn't take the risk. There are plenty of good stocks inside of the ETFs that we own, which are in good industries and good sectors. They have secular trends behind them. We don't need to take individual company risk on anything other than a company that can be great or already is great. For the companies that already are great, you usually need either a sector-wide correction like we've seen somewhat in the big cap technology recently, or just a general correlated entire market event where the stock market goes straight down. And that's when you can get your great stocks. Now, there are companies that are good on the surface right now, and then our analysis can figure out oftentimes whether or not they can become great. So those are the two categories, already great and then potentially great. And everything else you should ignore, which means 80 to 90% of the stocks in the stock market aren't worth your time. They're not worth your time and they're not worth your money because you can get exposure to good and lots of mediocre through ETFs. So when we try to find great companies, some of them are apparent, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google. These are companies that are Berkshire Hathaway. These are companies that we know are already great. And from time to time, we can get them on the cheap because there's a sector rotation or the whole market corrects. There's not a lot of those already great companies. What there are, are a lot of good companies to get huge run-ups in stock price and then a reversion to mean. You got to be careful with those. You take a look at some of the companies that people think are great And really, they're just good, and their stock prices are way ahead of themselves. Many, many, many of the dividend stocks were the good companies 
that we're getting great pricing, great share returns because people were chasing them. And then they came back dramatically. More recently, we've seen a lot of growth stocks go through the roof having to do with the pandemic, work from home, things like that. And then some of them have come back. And interestingly, some of the healthcare stocks that have come back 30, 40, 50% are suddenly stocks that we look at and go, hmm, these probably are on the way to being great companies. And now suddenly we're getting them on the cheap. So some companies are on track to become big winners in the future. And those companies will get added to the plug and play focus stocks. So with the growth stocks, we're looking for companies that can have a triple or better in a three to five year time frame. That doesn't mean they will. And it doesn't mean that we can absolutely predict that. But we can try to line things up, different factors that we can back test for and other, other ideas that make sense when it comes to secular uh, trends, and government policy, infrastructure, clean energy. We can take a look at what is on the side of a company that might take it from good to great. And if we can get in a little before the market figures it out, we're going to have a huge return. So we're looking for growth stocks that we think can triple or better in a three to five year time frame. Now, a stock that triples in five years has an annualized return of about 23%. But if it triples in three years instead of five, it's returned over 38% annualized. So triples are huge returns. Everybody's heard of the rule of 72. 72% in increments compounded is a double on your return. So if you get 12% for six years, total of 72%, your money actually doubles because of the compounding. The rule of 115 is for triples. So 115% compounded over a period of time is a triple. So 38% a year for three years actually triples your money. And that's why we look for growth rates that are in the 20s and 30s and 40s that we think are sustainable for several years and that the market hasn't priced in yet. And this doesn't happen a lot, but a lot of times we get these moments in time where there's an event it crushes a stock, shoots it out of the sky like it was, you know, a spaceship in Star Trek. There was a media stock that recently got blown up that way. We bought it last week. And it's on the plug and play for this quarter. And it was a stock that had run way up on speculation and leverage. And that leverage got blown up. And in fact, that company and a couple of others uh, also got blown up in the same hedge fund uh, debacle are good examples of the things that can happen when the leverage in the stock market unwinds. And I'm going through this again with you because I think that over the next year or two, as liquidity comes in, right, the central banks are already telling us that they're doing it, and that leverage becomes harder to maintain for individual investors and institutions. I mean, if, if a $10 billion hedge fund can blow up, you know, some guy with a $100,000 account because he was going three to one on leverage, he can blow up too. So we have to be careful. But as those blow ups occur, as the 2015-16 market type plays out, which is what I think we have going on here, choppy markets, rolling corrections, you know, if there's a black swan at some point or a more correlated correction, then, then that's what happens and we'll be ready for it. With our dividend stocks, we're looking for a total return of a double in three to five years, back to rule of 72. So if it takes five years to double our money, we average 14.4% or a little bit better. If we can double our money in three years, we return 24% per year. So let's think about one of the stocks that we've owned. We have owned AT&T for about two years, basically at the price that we've been buying it. We've been collecting a dividend in that six, 7% range. And we sold some options. Even though the stock hasn't moved, 
we're grinding out six, seven, some people who sell options, 10% against a stock that hasn't moved. And what if AT&T moves the way that I think it will? What if this consolidation of AT&T, which has been going on a while now, hit an ultimate bottom here, it looks like, keeps going out. But what if the fact that they own Warner, HBO Max, and some ad-supported services, and a piece of whatever the DirecTV spin out to private equity is going to become, what if they get back to the top of their trading range in the 40s? Okay, so that's a 50% gain. What if they break out of that trading range because their subscription revenue jumps because of HBO Max? And I'm telling you, if you haven't tried HBO Max, you should, because I'm ready to declare that it's better than Netflix. Them putting out these movies is brilliant. I just watched uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, or Godzilla versus King Kong on Friday night. Why? Because I grew up watching Godzilla movies on Saturday afternoon. I'm going to watch every Godzilla movie that ever comes out, and I'll be disappointed lots of times. This one was pretty good. You know, but then again, I'm, I'm, I'm also the guy who watched the Gadzuki little Godzilla movies, baby Godzilla a TV show for a couple seasons in cartoon form. But this is a company that people just think is good. Not a lot of risk, margin of safety, kicking out a big fat dividend, buying back shares, cutting debt. What does that remind you of? Shareholder yield. We talked about it here. So when a company can buy back shares, pay a dividend, and reduce debt, it's the holy grail of investing. And if AT&T succeeds in increasing revenue faster than what the market's giving them credit for, all of a sudden, this could be a $60, $70 stock. What if it goes Disney on the world? Right? Disney, let's, let's compare Disney with AT&T. Disney has the theme parks and then Disney streaming. AT&T has all the communications and then Warner. Why wouldn't AT&T go on a rally like that at some point? Especially given they're reducing debt. And that's a big deal. So this is a spot where people might say, well, what about the debt? What if interest rates go up? Interest rates are not going up in your lifetime. Should I make that any more clear to anybody? Interest rates will be in a low range forever. Inflation is not the boogeyman. Deflation is until the boomers start to die. And even after that, it's not that big of a problem because the generation after millennials is small. The generation after them, them is going to be small. And the population curve on the whole planet is turning over. The growth rate is falling off. Until that completely levels off in 30 or 40 years, you probably don't have to worry too much about inflation for a very long time. Now, that doesn't mean that inflation can't be a little higher for a little while. But get your secular trends right. The reality is that demographics are destiny. They always have been. They always will be. That will never change. Every back test shows it. I've shown every chart that I could over the years. Google Harry Dent. He's not a great forecaster on stocks, but he's got it nailed when it comes to how the broad economy will move. He's just not real precise, which is what hurts you when you try to pick stocks. So a company that can reduce its debt load, and there's a pretty good possibility that their revenues go up dramatically, it's just the wrong question to ask, what if interest rates go up? What if aliens come down here and give us the cure for everything and make us live eternally? And say, hey, how would you like to fly around the galaxy with us at 10 times the speed of light? It's about as likely as there being hyperinflation and big interest rates. I'll go out on a limb and say, in the next 20 years, you will not see the 10-year treasury over 5%. And I've been telling people that since they first got under 5%. Since I told people that the dollar was going to go in a bull market in 2012, and they told me I was nuts. I'm telling you now, the dollar is going to get stronger over time. Can it trade down in a range short term? Sure. 
but there's nothing going to prevent the dollar from getting stronger over time. There is not an economy on the planet that can match the United States economy in GDP per capita. Little economies, maybe, but no big, no big economies. So when we talk about interest rates and the dollar and all these other things, let's take a look at what's really been going on. Because for the last 12 years, we've printed more money than we ever thought we'd print. Again, quantitative ease, print, whatever term you want to use, just understand that we've been doing it. And it hasn't caused inflation. So why would it suddenly cause inflation now to print a couple trillion dollars? Why? What changed? Nothing. So AT&T, if they break out, they're going to break out hard. This consolidation pattern is classic. You, you should own a big slug of AT&T if you are a conservative or moderate investor. If you're aggressive, you may not want to own it because you want a bunch of more aggressive things. But even for aggressive investors, I think this is a great poor holding. I own it for everybody. So in this market, understand where we are on valuations. I still have people who are FOMO happy. Tell you what, look at that. Every indicator is showing either second or most expensive market in history. And again, adjusted for interest rates, I think it's probably second or even third. But we have a top three overvalued market in history even adjusted for interest rates, somewhere between one and three. And I'd say air on the side is saying three, which means that it can still run a little bit, but we just hit the shiny round number that I said in January that we would hit. So the S&P 500 just hit 3,000, excuse me, 4,000. Shiny round number. In the wake of margin debt setting records. So that means that either we're getting a correlated correction or we're gonna get rotating corrections and some of these people who are chasing stocks higher are going to get crushed overnight. How many stocks in the last month or two have we seen drop 20 to 30% overnight? Or 40 or 50%? Quite a few. Even GameStop, which is all over the place, is moving in hunks of 20 and 30%. When on earth has that ever been normal and not met with some sort of fury of the markets at some point? I don't know how much stronger I can be on this stuff. Jeremy Grantham gave an interview to Meb Faber, and I've posted it in the chats. You ought to watch it. Jeremy Grantham has nailed every big correction. He's usually a year or two early. Sometimes he's right on the money. You're going to get a chance to buy great companies cheaper over the next year or two. And you need to have the patience because what is the market? The market is a mechanism for taking money from the impatient and giving it to the patient. You need to have the patience to sift for the great companies that are only good right now and wait for the great companies to come back to you in price. Lockheed Martin is almost there. I'm talking about that one for a couple of years. Boy, when I get my chance to buy Lockheed Martin, I'm going to buy it. I tell you, it's a top 10 company in the world. I could almost list it with the Ma stocks in Berkshire. I don't because they don't have the pile of cash that those other companies have. They had 20 or 30 billion more laying on the balance sheet. They'd, they'd be up there with that other group of companies. So this is the plug and play from the first quarter, making it even simpler to read now. So here's your Ma stocks, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple. They're all still companies that we might want to buy. Why? Because we know that they're great. Sitting on mountains of cash. On the right side of secular growth. Almost could have Facebook in here. I wonder how big of a deal Facebook's going to be going forward. Because I think their growth is almost gone. I mean, seriously, I, I think there's more people using less Facebook less and they just did something, Facebook, that concerns me. As much as I like Oculus, I think it'll be a leader in, in VR. Facebook is getting rid of a lot of their diagnostics. And that tells me they got something to hide. It concerns me a lot. That they're making it harder to get data. 
and not consumer data, just raw data. You know, how many eyeballs have looked at your business site? Because people are using Facebook less, every one of you. If you've been using Facebook, you tell me in the last six months, are you using it more or less than you did a year ago? So I worry about Facebook because when the market finally prices in the fact that their growth is lower, and it's kind of been trying to do that, what is it really going to get priced at? Not a growth juggernaut anymore. But still, they'll be hugely rich, and I think they'll eventually pay a dividend. So I still want to buy it on a good dip. Berkshire Hathaway, we know, is a great company, and they buy their own shares back. These ranges have been updated on the new plug and play. Sustainable growth. I right? still want Facebook, just at lower prices. Invite is coming off. Why? Mainly because the gene editing companies are starting to run into the reality that there's a lot of competition, that Kathy Wood can't keep them all up by herself, and that their patent portfolios don't carry as much weight as you'd think, especially in Vitae. I've been reading up on their patent portfolio and it's not as good as it should be. And with competition, even if they have a patent, it doesn't matter, somebody just invents something new. Plus, the gene editing companies are gonna start running into regulation. What do I mean by that? Your CRISPR companies, right? All the, the whole group going to run into a lot of problems because at some point the politicians are going to write laws that only the super duper wealthy can get around when it comes to having designer babies. I want a baby that's going to be six foot seven, run a four three forty, and has an IQ of two hundred. Right, that is the future of gene editing if we allow it to be. In which case, what are the ramifications of that from philosophical levels to health levels. If you didn't read Lewis Thomas a long time ago, I recommend going and reading Lewis Thomas. Pretty much all these companies are staying on here. I worry a little bit about Roku being so far ahead of itself. I might take it off of this list, but leave it on the VSL. I haven't decided because I don't know that it can double or triple again in the next few years. We'll see. On the dividend side, one of the things I wanted to show you, and this is what we talked about, I talked about with Meb Favor, uh, we talked about shareholder yield. And what you'll see is that it, we really want to see companies buying back shares, right? But a lot of companies don't, and I still like them. How come? Well, look at what they are. Read, read, read. Why would we be okay with a re raising money right now? Because there's probably a certain real estate that's attractive for them, right? A lot of strip malls going under. Store can go out there and buy some. It's big, upgrading industrial space. That, and this is one of my favorite REITs. Upgrading industrial space and warehouse space as supply chains move back to America. Vici, now, I will say MGM has got a good REIT too. Why do I like Vici even more? Because they're undervalued. They got the capital injection a couple of years ago when they did that merger indirectly. There was a merger, right? Caesars got bought. It secured a lot of those leases. And now they bought the Venetian, which is hands down, hands down, the best luxury casino in Las Vegas. They're nothing okay. close. Aria is awesome. So are a couple other MGM properties. But the Venetian is the jewel of Las Vegas Strip. So you have to understand what buyback yield means. So all these companies are just operating companies. And here you go. You have CRISPR needing to raise money for general business purposes. And yet it's super expensive. Okay. So you have to be careful. And you see some of these other gene editing companies on here. So now you get back to where companies are starting to become what Charlie Munger called cannibals. They're eating their share count. Interestingly, Pioneer, which I've said is the, really the only independent 
U.S. oil company that you might want to own. I don't own it. And all of a sudden, look, Merck with a dividend yield, shareholder yield of 4%, good earnings yield. Not great, but good. Alta, very interesting. Not paying a dividend, but they're starting to buy back some shares again. Again, this is, Alta is a good company. And actually, I have taken them off of the plug and play quarter ago. Why? I'm not so sure they can be great. I think they're going to be a good company forever. I don't know if they'll ever be great. Take a look at their business model. How would they possibly generate bigger revenues and bigger margins at the same time? The only thing they could possibly do is really increase their online revenue. And there's a lot of competition there. Walmart. I think will be a good company forever. Just got my Johnson & Johnson shot actually today at a Walmart. This company here, Quidel, testing, diagnostics. This is a company that I'm creating a separate list for, a company to keep an eye on. Why? Because as I said earlier, a bunch of the healthcare companies, which spiked up are, and have come back, are now talking about mergers and acquisitions, getting synergies out of mergers. Right in their conference call, they talked about it. So this is a stock that pulls back any more, I'd probably have to buy just on the idea that they can get back to their highs if they merged with Pygon or Exact Sciences or something, or just got bought outright by a Pfizer or something. When you go down this list, you go, okay, Who's really starting to buy back shares? Go, hmm, Gilead, Visa, AT&T, look at that. Plus dividend yield, a 9.2% shareholder yield. And this calculation doesn't include reducing debt or refinancing it. The traditional definition of shareholder yield is just combination of dividend yield and buyback yield. I take a look at debt reduction too, or the balance sheet as well, because a company is borrowing a lot of money to buy back shares and pay dividends, like Exxon is probably not in great shape. And you keep coming down this list and you go, oh, look, Apple, buybacks and a dividend. Dividend should be higher. The share prices ran. Still pretty good though, 4.2% shareholder yield. You start to find companies Serious XM Holdings. You go, huh, this is really interesting. One of the companies that had a real high shareholder yield a couple of years ago was GameStop. That was one of the reasons I got on them early on. And then I didn't trust management, I got out. But as management started to talk about doing the things that I said they should do two years later, and they got an activist investor, stock went nuts and it became a meme stock. It's probably not really worth more than 40 bucks a share, even if they get a lot of subscriptions. But you can see what happens to a market when it grabs onto an idea. Modern stock that we own. And then it's interesting, you take a look at companies like Regeneron, and they're on here because they have some buybacks, but they might have some growth in the next couple of years. So at the right price, Regeneron comes back to us come back somewhat. I think it needs to get down to around in the 300s somewhere for me to get real serious about it. Because remember, about a dividend, I need this one to be about a triple over a three to five year stretch. Unless some of those phase two drugs hit and they got eight of them in the pipeline over the next couple of years, you know, you're probably not gonna get big growth here. But as the day gets closer to those FDA decisions, and if we can get the right price, or you might get that day where you say, hmm, Regeneron's cheap enough to be pretty safe, and it's got the possibility of making a bunch of money. So, and this is what Stock Rover is good at. I mean, really, if you're screening for stocks yourself, you should probably have Stock Rover. If you're not screening for stocks, you don't really need it because you can track your portfolios anywhere. But if you're really going to screen for stocks, Stock Rover is pretty awesome. So I've been updating these charts. 
took a look at AT&T. One of the ones that's still on the plug and play is Barrett Gold. You have just got a dynamite pullback here. Look at it start to jitterbug around. What's the next part of this move? At least it'll retest the highs. I think it'll break out. In fact, I think it'll break out pretty far. I think you're probably going to see fair gold up around 50. And sometimes I remember put that arrow in because the target price, I don't mean it's going to happen right there, but it, somewhere out here, it's going to get up there. If it breaks past about here, gets past here, that's a huge breakout waiting to happen. You can get in on it down here. It's in the buy zone that we identified months ago. So some of you have round tripped it, bought it down here, took it up here, and now it's back. But if you've been selling covered calls or recently been selling cash secured puts, pretty interesting position for you. Because what if Bitcoin does get yelling? Like I think it's going to get yelling. You know, one of the things that I'll be talking about with a uh, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith in an interview that we have coming up. He's a professor at Lehman College and a Forbes columnist. So uh, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith, if you've got a Forbes subscription, you should read his stuff. Uh, find it where you can. All right, so in the next day or two, I will finish up this plug and play. It's pretty much done. I just wanna give you some more uh, descriptive language, some quick thoughts why I added some things, why I subtracted some things. Black Rock came off wide because it's overvalued and overbought. We've talked about that. And I think that they have competition coming. I think a lot of these 100, 200, 300 million dollar firms are gonna start raising lots of money in ETFs because people want management. And your big players like QQQ will keep being big players but I'm not so sure you're going to see a whole lot of millennials buying SPY. They don't want the rest of that stuff. They want tech, they want management, they want a new economy, they want sustainability. And until they get really burned, they want Bitcoin. That burn is coming. Bitcoin is gonna trade like a commodity, not going to become a currency. It's going to be a crypto commodity. It's regulated and has its market limited. He had one question, uh, people are asking about Ajax. They uh, took Kazoo public, like Carvana. I don't want to own it. So I'm getting rid of Ajax where I can because there's going to be some dilution because of the warrants at some point in a year and then again in two years. And I don't think most people are going to buy their cars online. I think most of us will still continue to go and test drive a few cars, sit in them, see how we like them. So while first mover advantage makes a big impact in certain industries and in other industries, it's just a short-term thing. It's a flash in the pan. Somebody says that Europe's used car market is a $700 billion opportunity with only 2% online. Meh. Why would one company dominate that market? Why wouldn't there be five or six or seven? And what makes you think that most used cars are going to get bought online sight unseen? Well, they come with big warranties. And what do we know about warranties? Most warranties are overpriced and don't offer the right protection. I don't see a lot of used cars really getting sold online. Just can't see it. Maybe I'm wrong. It seems to me that they have huge market risk and huge execution risk, likely competition coming, which means that they'll have to be fighting over price. So if the margins are too big, right, what do we know? Competition always comes. So it's a rule of economics. I don't see where the moat is. Where is their protection? So you can turn your... Ajax shares in and then hold on to the warrants because you can't turn in the warrants. And that's the beauty of speculating with a SPAC near the IPO price. You can sell the shares. You know, you might have to game it a little bit, sell a pop. But then you hold the warrants 
And if the stock does well short term, hey, there you go. Most of the SPACs can be split anytime you want to, right? Like some, I forget what the days are after the IPO, but almost everything with the exception of a few of our SPACs can be split. I just haven't had the time to do it for me, but you know, and then a lot of them split themselves. So as I find companies that I'm going to split and where I sell the stock and I hold the warrant, but most, most of the things you're better off just selling it outright because they're not under $10. So as they announce deals, you have to decide if you like the deal or not. I'm not ex excited about the kazoo deal. And the market hasn't been terribly excited about it either. I should tell you something. I really should tell you something. Right? Not a real, not a real excited market, is it? I think I should get rid of this. Maybe not right at that price. Maybe wait for a little pop. But the market doesn't love that deal. So if at some point the market does love the deal, then owning the warrants is worth your time. So split your units. Sell the shares, keep the warrants. You got to talk to your brokerage about, right? If you want to redeem your shares, you know, you got to have the, you know, they have to split out anyway. I don't know what day the kazoo deal was, but again, it's not generated any excitement. I might take my one or two dollar lock. I bought the dumb thing up here. I take my one or two dollars, hold on to the warrant, and hope there's a, some love for this down the road. All right, so I will put out the new list, has, a, has just a few more growth companies, including a space stock, getting rid of BlackRock, getting rid of Vite. In fact, Disney is no longer on the list, just way too overvalued. Still on the VSL, if it pulls back 20 or 30%, I'd have to probably buy it. That last spike was obnoxious. Not something that probably double in the next three to five years from the current prices. That's really what I'm looking for. So again, Lumen Technologies has been great. Kinder Morgan, all the reasons we've talked about. Barrett Gold, all the reasons we've talked about. Nutrien, Stunwell. I think in a couple of years, you're gonna look at Stag Industrial and go, whoa, I wish I had bought that. All right. Have a fantastic rest of the night. Enjoy the basketball game. And Aaron Rodgers is hosting Jeopardy tonight. Have a nice night.